stand as we read responsively our call to worship. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Death has been swallowed in victory. The, the grave, grave has, has lost its sting. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. We are all alive in Christ. Glory to God. Alleluia. Let us sing our Alleluia's in hymn 302. We will be singing all four verses. Today is a special day in the life of our church as we celebrate the confirmation of our confirmation class. And uh, I want to invite the members of that class to come forward now. I want to invite Tyler Baker and Will Brown, uh, Palmer Collette, uh, Jacqueline Demiers, Addie McCown, uh, Daniel McDonald, Anna Simpson, and Logan Thomas.
congregation may turn to page 33 in your hymnal. Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation, and we're given new birth through water in this spirit. And all of that is God's gift, given to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, and we acknowledge what God is doing for us, and we affirm our co commitment to Christ's holy church. Today, I want to present to you Addie McCown and Daniel McDonald for reaffirmation of their faith and confirmation. Also, we want to note that Anna Simpson and Logan Thomas were baptized at our 9 o'clock service, and uh, Tyler and Will and Palmer and Jacqueline and Anna and Logan were confirmed, and I've asked them to come and join us uh, again at this service so you could see them. Some of them had to leave, but uh, most of them are here today. I will say this, uh, Will uh, Brown and Palmer Collette uh, and uh, Jacqueline, De De Jacqueline Demers are going to reaffirm their faith and be baptized a little bit later in the Elkhorn Creek. Uh, their preacher is a big baby and he didn't want to go in the cold water, so uh, we're going to wait till it gets a little warmer uh, to do that. <laughs> I want to ask the confirmation class these, uh, these questions. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world, and do you repent of your sin? And do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with Christ, or in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I want to ask the parents of, of these folks, and uh, well, first, let me introduce to you the faithful friends, the friends of faith that have been with them throughout this process. Any of them here today that they might stand? Any of you, there's some in the back and here, Rusty and Kim are here. Uh, I want to, we've had a, a great group of friends in faith who have walked this pilgrimage with each of these uh, confirmants, and they uh, have been very faithful in the process, and we th give thanks for that. I'm going to ask the parents of these folks uh, now to come forward. Um, can we do that quickly, I think? Yeah? And come and stand behind your son or your daughter. We can scoot this way a little bit. As sponsors of these confirmands, I want to ask each of you as parents, will you, uh, will you support and encourage them in their Christian life? We will. And do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include all of these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. And now I'm going to ask the confirmation class to share with us their original creed as, as they wrote it, that proclaims our faith. Will you join me, guys? 
We believe in the one awesome God, the only God, the true creator of heaven and earth. We believe God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, who was humble and courageous. We believe Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate and gave his life on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And through the resurrection from the dead, Christ became the epic ruler of everlasting life. We believe in the body of the universal church and that the Holy Spirit bonds us through love and honesty to our family and friends through the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We believe in the second coming of Christ and through his mer grace and mercy we have the promise of life everlasting. Amen. Isn't that powerful? And we appreciate our class as they wrote that. I want to take just a moment before we give a thanksgiving over the water to thank Reverend Tanya Kenner, who was my co-leader in this uh, confirmation class. And uh, I couldn't have done that without her, and I really appreciate her help. Now in your, in your hymnal, uh, turn over to the next page, I think it is, uh, for the thanksgiving over the water. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and you brought forth light. And in the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. And after the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. And their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare Christ's his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and these who receive it to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Let's take that to Addie. Let's bring it over to Eddie. You want to step forward? Place your own hands in the water. Eddie McCowan, remember your baptism and be thankful. Will you all place your hands on her, please? And Eddie, may the Holy Spirit work within you. That being born through water in the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Daniel, you come forward. You folks, place your hands in the water. Daniel, remember your baptism and be thankful. Let's place our hands on him, please. Daniel, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water in the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to ask the confirmation class. We asked this question at 9 o'clock, but I'm going to do it again for this 11 o'clock service. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal through the United, to, uh, through the, to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Will you do that? I will. And as members of this congregation, First United Methodist Church, Will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you do that? I will. Then I want to extend to you again the right hand of Christian fellowship and welcome you into the family of First United Methodist Church. God bless you. 
I also want to share with you that uh, Todd and Alicia Brown here, Will's mom and dad, and their, uh, their son Drew, Drew comes as a preparatory member, but Todd and Alicia uh, joined the church this morning at the 9 o'clock service, transferring their letter from the uh, First Baptist Church here in town. And then uh, I wanted to introduce to you uh, DJ and Mark and Zach and Gunner and Jet Wasson. I think they're in the back here, but uh, they, uh, they transferred their letter this morning as well at the 9 o'clock service. Now let's have the commendation and welcome, can we? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, hope, uh, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Will you join me? We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless all of you, and thank you. Welcome. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. You may be seated. While they're being seated, I'm going to ask, uh, we had several in our membership 101 class this year, and I want to ask them that, that want to join the church today to come forward. I know we have several, I think. I want to introduce these folks to you. First, uh, David Hughes over here on the end. Uh, David is transferring his letter today from the Buck Run Baptist Church here in Frankfurt. And then there's uh, Bob and Joyce Wilcher. Uh, Bob is transferring his letter from the New Hope Baptist Church. And Joyce is transferring her letter from the Grace United Methodist Church in Zanesville, Ohio. And then uh, Terry Magel. Terry is transferring his membership from the St. Anne Catholic Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then Cassandra Bagley. Uh, Cassandra is joining today on a profession of faith, and we rejoice in that. Nancy Schaffner is transferring her membership from the Salvation Army Church in Lancaster, Ohio. And then Adam and Leanne uh, Scott are joining, or uh, transferring their letter from the, uh, let's see, it was First United Methodist Church in Murray, Kentucky. And their two children, uh, Grayson and Asher, who's with you? I can't. Grayson's here. Uh, they will be coming, certainly, as preparatory members. Now, friends, we've been through the class. We, they know everything about the church there is to know. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be teaching the class next time. We're excited to receive them today and all these folks who come. And I ask you the question that's been asked of all the members of this church. Will you support the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you do that? We will. And I want to extend to you the right hand of Christian fellowship and welcome you into First United Methodist Church. What a joy and honor it is today. What a blessing. God bless you. Bless you, David. Will you greet these folks and welcome them? Today, as we gather in this place, we know that God has overcome the grave. And what a celebration that is. Today, as we gather, though, we know that there is reality. We have joys and celebrations. We also have pain and fear. And so we bring all of that to the Lord. 
and Christ is ready to receive our prayer. So let's bow our heads and pray. Loving and holy God, as we gather in this place today, we rejoice in the knowledge that you are Savior and Lord. We rejoice in the knowledge that you live, and we, get, and we give thanks for the resurrection. What an honor it is to worship today and give thanks for all that we have and dream of being comes from you, and we are grateful. Today, as we worship, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity for ministry and mission that you, do, that you give us through our church. And we pray, O oh Lord, for all churches everywhere, that as we worship today, that we will hear your call to come and be a part of your kingdom work. Holy God, today as we worship, we bring to you our joys and celebrations. But we also know that there are many that are hurting, some physically, and you, are, you continue to be the great healer. Many in this very room have witnessed the power of your anointed healing. And we give thanks for that. You are our strength and our guide. And you are our comforter. And there are many today that as we celebrate the joy of resurrection, we acknowledge that there are many that are not by our side this day. And we miss them. And we thank you, Lord, that you're our comforter. And you're the one who can fill that void left in our hearts and our lives. Lord, our desire today is to be your church and to hear your call and to obey. And so bless us. Bless our church, our country, our community. Bless our world and may your peace come upon it. And bless, O oh God, those who protect the freedom and the liberty that we enjoy to be able to worship here without fear. Now, Lord, bless us as we join our voices and we share together the prayer that you taught your own disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
the honor today of sharing the greatest news of all, the news of resurrection. Let's stand together as we hear the gospel. Today our scripture comes from the gospel of John in the 20th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And then Peter and the other disciples set out, and they went toward the tomb. And the two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For as yet he didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood there weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away the Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went. And she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us respond to the scripture by remain standing and singing number 610. And our choir will insert a third verse and then we'll sing the third verse.
Be seated. Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, as your word is revealed, we pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth will be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Before I begin, I've got to say thank you to David and Roy, and the choir, and all the musicians that we have had during our Lenten season. It has truly been a fantastic uh, time of reflection, and, uh, and I thank you especially for guiding us through that and helping us in so many ways. I want to thank all of you for attending so many of the different services that we've had throughout the time. And again, I want to say a word of congratulations and gratitude for our confirmation class. Uh, I got to tell you a quick story. When I uh, I told the, the young people that I would guide them through that today, not to be nervous. I did that because when I was 12 years old, I went through confirmation class, and the preacher did just like we did today. He asked the class to come forward, and so I stood up. The next thing I knew, I woke up in my dad's car. I passed out, and I. Was So I didn't want any of that happening today, so uh, anyway. Let me start out with a scenario for you. Every day, a gentleman goes to work, and every day, he would ride the elevator all the way to the bottom floor of his high-rise apartment building that he lived in. But when he came home from work, he would ride the elevator only up to the sixth floor. He'd get off, and then he'd get in the stairway and take the stairs all the way up to the apartment, the floor where his apartment was, many stories higher. He did that every day, except on days when it rained. On those days, when he came home from work, he would take the elevator all the way up to his floor. Wonder why? Here's another one to think about. Anne is lying on the floor, dead. There's broken glass, some water around. And Stuart is over there, asleep on the couch, seemingly oblivious to Anne's death. How did Anne die? Do you ever play those kind of games where you're presented with a scene? <laughs> I see some of you nodding your heads. And you're only allowed to ask yes and no questions. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you the answers to all that so you won't be sitting there going, I wonder how that happened anyway. Okay. Well, the first one, the gentleman who would only go to the sixth floor on his return home from work, he did that because, honestly, that was the highest button he could reach on the elevator panel. He was a very short man. On the days that it rained, though, he had his umbrella with him, and he could reach up there and poke that top one. And... In the other situation, Anne, i got to tell you, is a fish. And Stuart is a cat, yeah. And Stuart knocked the, the glass over and broke it. And you know the rest of that story. Let's try one more. Friday afternoon, a man dies, and he's buried on that same night. And Sunday morning, some friends of his arrive to, at the tomb that he is buried in to pay their last respects, only to discover that the body is gone. What happened? My friends, you know what happened. The tomb is empty. Nobody doubted that part of the women's story. And so what they needed to decide for themselves was why was it empty? And what did it all mean? 
And friends, you and I are here today, and we have to decide the same thing. We all agree, I think, that the tomb is empty. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't believe that. But the question is, how are we going to respond to this empty tomb? How is it going to affect our life? Now, you heard this scripture. There were three people talked about in that scripture who all responded a little differently to what they found. The first one to the tomb was the, the disciple that Jesus loved, John. And when John heard the news, he jumped up and he ran with all of his might to get to the tomb. He wanted to believe. Friends, of all the disciples, he had been, if you will, the most faithful. He'd been in the courtyard when Jesus was interrogated and sentenced to die. He'd been there at the foot of the cross as he watched Jesus die. He was there to take Jesus' mother into his own home and care for her. He was so excited about the possibility that Jesus might actually be alive that he ran faster than he ever had before. But when he got to the tomb, he didn't go in. He looked inside. He saw what Mary had said was there, but he stayed outside. Maybe he stayed outside because, you know, he had to catch his breath after that run. I know I would have, you know. I'd <laughs> he'd be roughing and puffing. Maybe he stayed outside because he was afraid. I mean, what if Mary was wrong? What if Jesus' body just had been moved to another part of the grave? John didn't really want to, want to see Jesus all mangled from the torture of the beating and certainly the cross. What if once Peter and John were in the tomb, what if some guards suddenly appeared it could have been a, an elaborate trap set up by the Roman government. They'd taken Jesus' body away to lure the disciples there. And once the disciples arrived, they would arrest those disciples and, and charge them with trying to steal the body to make it look like Jesus had risen from the dead. The empty tomb was enough evidence for John that what the other women had said was true. Jesus really had risen from the, de from the dead. John didn't need to see Jesus to know that Jesus was alive. He had heard Jesus' prophecies and teachings about his, uh, resurrect or his death and resurrection. And now here it is. Here's the empty tomb. It was enough. A lot of you here today are probably like John. The empty tomb is enough. You believe that? You believe it because of the testimony of lots of Christians in the centuries that followed? We don't need to see to believe. In fact, we join with John in being the ones whom Jesus speaks about in a few verses later in that same scripture that I was reading to you. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. John reacted to the empty tomb with belief. And then you got Peter. Peter was a little slower than John to arrive at the tomb. I don't know, maybe it was because John was younger than Peter. Or maybe it was because of all those years of fishing uh, that had given Peter uh, arthritis. Do any of you know what I'm talking about there? In his knees and in his back. He didn't move too fast. Or maybe it was because he was afraid. Afraid of what he might find. Oh, he wasn't afraid of the soldiers for... I mean, Peter was the one who whacked off the ear, one of them, a few days ago. Peter wanted to see Jesus, but there was this part of him inside that dreaded that idea because the last time their eyes had met, it was just after Peter had denied Jesus. If Peter saw Jesus, he knew he was going to have to be confronted with his sin and with his guilt. Peter's vision was clouded, my friends. It was clouded by the pain that, that fell over his past. He wanted Jesus to be alive, but he didn't know how he was going to be able to face him after that. Maybe some of you are here today, and that's kind of what you're feeling. You want to believe, but there's so much history back here in the past. It's just too much to believe too difficult to believe that Jesus' resurrection could wipe away all your pain. But my friends, listen, I'm here to tell you today that Jesus Christ can, will, and desires to forgive you and to heal your wounds. 
Peter went in. He examined the evidence for himself. He saw the linen uh, cloth wrapped that wrapped Jesus' body in the piece of cloth that had been around his head. It was enough to prove that something had happened. But it wasn't enough to prove that Jesus was alive. In fact, if you read in another gospel account in the, in, in the book of Luke, it says there that Peter was wondering to himself what had happened. Peter was a skeptic. He needed more evidence. And Peter then did something, one of the most foolish things that he ever did in his life. You remember? I read it. Did you hear it? In verse 10 it says, the disciples returned to their homes. Peter left. Something as important as this, and he leaves without even coming to a conclusion as to what happened. You know, if Peter had just hung around a little longer, he would have gotten to experience the same miracle that Mary was about to see. There wasn't enough evidence because, my friends, he didn't hang around long enough. A lot of people today don't hang around long enough. They don't have enough evidence to place their faith in Jesus because they don't hang around. They don't read God's word enough. They don't spend enough time with God's people. They don't, read the, they don't pray near enough. They get up off their knees and walk out that door before the miracle happens. They aren't present to see the miracle of God, changing, God's changing power. My family, today I want to tell you, don't leave. Don't leave before the miracle happens, okay? Paul, I mean Peter, walked, I'm looking at Paul Brunster, our district superintendent Elizabeth. Welcome, Paul. Good to see you. <laughs> Peter, Peter walked away, my friends, with his heart broken. Do you hear that? Don't let that happen to you. And then there's Mary, Mary Magdalene. When Peter and John left, Mary stayed. And the angel asked her that good question. He said, why are you crying? You remember back over in verse 1, when we started our scripture for today, it said it was still dark. It's talking about the time of day, but it's also talking about the condition of their hearts. Mary had lost that which was most valuable to her, more valuable than anything else. She had lost Jesus. Why was that valuable? Because to her, Jesus was release. You may not remember this story, but when Jesus met uh, Mary, she was enslaved by seven demons. And Jesus had cast those demons out, and she was set free. She had peace. Jesus meant peace for her. Any of you have small children? Anybody here? A lot of you do. Yeah, I see lots of hands around. You know what it is to have small children pulling at your coattails in all different directions? Can you imagine having seven demons in your head trying to take you all in different directions at the same time, places you don't want to go? When Jesus cast those out, he gave her peace. And then forgiveness. Not only had Jesus released her from her demons, he'd released her from her sin. He'd forgiven her all those actions that had allowed those demons to inhabit her in the first place. And lastly, it was somebody to believe in. Well, there was somebody to believe in. When Jesus was alive, Mary had become a part of a group of women that financially supported him. She had believed that in what he was doing. And I tell you, I think everybody needs somebody to believe in. And while we're here, let me mention one other thing. He was her leader. She was lost without Jesus. She had given her life to Jesus. His life had given her life meaning. And now that he was gone, she was like a lost puppy with not knowing where to go or who to believe. And so she cried. She wept. But then, my friends, the miracle happened. Are you ready? Here we go. Verse 14, it says, When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? And supposing him to be the gardener, he said to her, she said to him, rather, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned. She said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me right now. 
because I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go tell my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. I'm ascending to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and she announced to all the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Seeing the Lord, my friends. That's what Mary wanted. That's all she wanted. More than anything else, she wanted that. She wanted to see him so badly that she was willing to face him, even if his face was covered with blood, even if his body was mangled from the torture, she would not turn away in disgust. Mary wanted to see Jesus. Mary got her desire because she said, I have seen the Lord. How many of us can say that today? You see, my friends, every single one of us in this room is like one of these three persons who went to the empty tomb that day, and all three of them had been told what had happened. Mary had been told by the angels. Peter and John had been told by the other women. All three saw the tomb, and all three examined it, and all three came away with a different understanding. Some of us are like that. We're like John. We see the empty tomb. We believe it. In fact, Jesus says that we are blessed. But some of us are like Peter. We see the empty tomb and we don't know what to believe. There's something going on, but we don't know what to say. We might say, well, I don't understand all this religion stuff. I don't understand why people would willingly get up every Sunday morning and give up their sleep and their freedom and their time and come to church. I want to tell you there's only way you're going to understand that. Only one way. And stick around. Stick around. Come back again and again. Until you see the miracle in your own life. Stay long enough at the foot of the cross. Stay long enough at the empty tomb. And of course, some of us are like Mary. We see that empty tomb. We see the change in people's lives. And we think there's got to be some practical explanation as to what's happened. Ma Mary, listen, Mary didn't believe at first. Are you with me? But she hung around long enough to have her questions answered and her faith grew. Maybe that's you. Either you're not quite sure what happened that day, or really, you're not quite sure what happened that day, what part that's going to play in your life on this day. You may ask, what does it all mean, or what does it mean for me? My friend, since Jesus is alive, Jesus can be those things that Mary thought she had lost. Uh, what, re release and peace and forgiveness and a sense of purpose and, 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 uh, and um, leadership? Here it is. Today, maybe you're ready to believe in Jesus. If you're ready to believe, maybe you've had a prayer answered, and you, see, and you can say, I've seen Jesus. Then I want to give God thanks for that. And what a blessing it is. If it's been a while, though, and you're not sure, I want to suggest to you stick around. Come back next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. Come back until you see Jesus. But my friends, listen, listen, listen. Do not be like Peter and walk out that door with your heart broken or your heart empty. Don't say no to the pleas of God as he calls you. But let me encourage you to offer yourself today. And I promise you, God will give you new life. I'm going to ask Roy to come and simply play uh, just a por portion of that song, Because He Lives. And then uh, I want you just to take a moment and, and pray and ask God to be in your heart. Take this moment. We're not going to prolong this. But, but just ask God to come into your heart and to make you alive in Christ. And as we do that, and as we'll close in a moment and we'll sing that verse of Because He Lives. Roy, will you play just a moment? And let's pray together. Let me invite you to stand. 
And let's sing together this verse, Because He Lives. It's number 364. Because He coming into our lives because you live all things are possible abide in us lord and we give you thanks amen be seated friends our ushers are preparing to come forward now so let's prepare ourselves to offer our gifts and our tithes to almighty god What a blessing it is, O oh God, to be able to experience the resurrection and realize that you've given your all for us. And now as we share in this time of giving, we want to give our all to you. Make us generous people and give us the opportunity to glorify you now through these gifts and tithes. Bless them. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
closing hymn is number 303. Let's sing the first and last verse, the day of resurrection. Receive this benediction and join in for the benediction response. And now, O oh God, as we go from this place, we thank you for the blessing of resurrection. And give us now the empowerment and boldness and faith to share this great news. And give us now your peace that passes all understanding. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs>